Now to our special conversation this evening, celebrating the paperback release of Elaine Chia Cho's debut novel, Disorientation. The hilarious satire is an examination of privilege and power in America and is described by Alexander Chi as wickedly funny and knowing, where Cho's dagger wit is sure-eyed intent on what feels like decolonization of her protagonist, if not the reader, that just might set her free. Our celebrated author is, a, is the Taiwanese American writer from California. Her debut novel, Disorientation, was a New York Times Editor's Choice Book Award, a Malala, Club, a Malala Book Club pick, and an Indie Next pick. A 2017 Rona Jaffe Graduate Fellow at NYU and a 2021 NYFA Artist Fellow. Her Push Card Award winning short fiction appears in Guernica, Tin House Online, Plowshares, AEWW's The Margins, and The Atlantic. Her short story collection, Where Are You Really From, is forthcoming from Penguin Press. Elaine is joined in conversation by Sabrina Imbler, who is a science writer living in Brooklyn. They are the author of the essay collection, How Far the Light Reaches, and the chapbook Dyke Geology. Imbler is a staff writer at Defector Media, an employee-owned sports and culture site where they write blogs about creatures and the natural world. Everyone, please give a warm welcome to Elaine and Sabrina. Thank you. Thank you so much, T. Thank you, Janae and Ezekiel. I hope I pronounced that right. And of course, um, my dear friend, Sabrina, it's so special to me to get to do an event with such a close friend. Um, and I love that. Me, can, can I say how we met? Of course, say how, many, how we met. <laughs> <laughs> we met at the Tin House summer workshop 2018 during the uh racial reckoning of that summer <laughs> and like this sort of impromptu like asian meetup um and we were we were baby writers and look at us now <laughs> and it's yeah. so special to me to be here with you it is so special to do this event with you elaine like i really can't begin to describe how this journey has felt like I really it was like before either of us had book deals before either of us had books just like being in this river in Portland and like Oregon and <laughs> talking about like our dreams for our books mm -hmm. and it's just been such an honor and a privilege to watch disorientation soar into the hands of so many readers and like everyone who has seen this book has also seen this cover <laughs> which I feel like is also, yeah, just a, a testament to like the wonder inside this book. Um, but I just first wanted to like check in and just hear like Elaine on this, the day of disorientation mm. paperback launch, how are you feeling? How are you feeling? Oh, also that was so beautiful. Thank you. Um, I feel, I feel great. I think uh, the paperback lower stakes, which is great because <laughs> I think the hardback, as you remember, I'm sure fresh, you know, from December, it's it's so much, it, there's so much anxiety because it's like literally the first entry into the world that for anyone, not just like your parents <laughs> and friends, you know, art can read it. And um, I think once you get over that hurdle, and it's been a year now. So I've, you know, we've all, I think, had to like learn like what is it like to be out in the world in that way and to be exposed in that way. So I feel like I've been able to process that um, mostly. And so the paperback is just a sort of great anniversary. Like, oh my God, it, it has been a year. And I've really tried to hustle for a year. And I'm also really ready to to give my all to the paperback launch and then, um, I don't know, float away into the ether. <laughs> and that, so that's why I think this, this, I'm very excited for this to, you know, this is more accessible, it's more affordable, which is so important because like, who can buy a $32 with tax, you know, hardcover? It's a, it's a limited demographic. And I was so grateful to every person who, who did that, but I'm so glad that this book can just, be more affordable. Um, Absolutely. I also, I was um, 
Chantal Johnson, whose uh, book Post Traumatic, I think, is also out in paperback today, described the paperback oh, as like an ergonomic reading experience. And I was like, <laughs> it is. Like, it bends, it's supple, like, we love it. <laughs> Maybe I'll buy the paperback so I can add it to my three copies. Of the oh Vegas. no, you really, please I don't. Already I, will, have. I will give you all of a sudden. Um, and it's funny because Elaine and I both went to see this show at the Asia Society this weekend about, um, it was called Comparative Hells. And it was about like different versions of hell mm -hmm. uh, as, you know, it's been, as it's been depicted in different Asian cultures. And I mean, hell feels very relevant to uh, the subject of disorientation, but it's also, we saw this one uh, painting where there were various hells that sinners were being subjected to, but then there was kind of this like bridge, almost like, yeah, like a pathway to heaven that like wasn't depicted, but like, I'm imagining you just like being transported on this cloud <laughs> into heaven, like into a better place doing better things I love living, that yeah living I'm all of writing away writing away on um, those cute those cute clouds like I don't know what to call it is it an Asian cloud but you guys know what I mean right I'm like this is the superior cloud it's so cute it's curly it's curly it's got it's those curly. little wispies yes <laughs> um but to get to the subject at hand and to talk mm -hmm. about your wonderful book disorientation which just I love so much and I have been recommending to everyone I love in the past year. Um, it is absolutely a book that may, makes you laugh out loud. I remember the first time I read it, I was on a plane and I was like, ha, ha. I was like chortling on the plane and I was absolutely disturbing <laughs> the people around me. But it's also a book that is very anchored in real world events that are not that funny and that, you know, are actually more like rageful or tragic. Mm. And I, mm. I wanted to ask you if you could talk a little bit about some of the real world stories that sort of formed, helped form the blueprint of disorientation and, and sparked your urge to write it. Ooh, yes, yes, for sure. Also love an airplane cackle. I feel like every author's dream is to like, like someone reading it very prominently, like holding it up so everyone can see the cow and then like having like a visceral reaction. <laughs> everyone. It's available for purchase now. <laughs> anyway, I love that. Um, okay, yes. How did Ryan Lee Wong, Ryan Lee Wong, another amazing writer, describe like the Asian American like tragedy of 2015? How did he put that? We were all like collect the collective trauma of 2015, which was Michael Derrick Hudson pretended to be Yi Fen Chow, spelt like um, my last name, and he stole that name from a real Chinese American woman he grew up with, which just feels, makes it even worse, um, when he couldn't get his poem published, and it was a poem that had like Chinese mythology in it, and he was like, clearly the problem isn't my poem, and every writer knows like you're supposed to be rejected a million times, it's part of being a writer. <laughs> But he was like, the problem is I'm white. I'm a white man. And no one will publish white men. <laughs> or so he was like, I'm just going to change my name, Yi Fen Chao. And then he submitted it to a diversity issue of an anthology. So it was specifically for poets of color. And then it got accepted. And he immediately and like gleefully told on himself to be like, see, see, systems rigged against white men. <laughs> and everyone was just like, you haven't, well, all you've done is revealed you're a horrible person. <laughs> um, and so when I read this incident, like the novel at that point was not about mm, identity theft in that way, but I was like, I must write about it. I was so incensed and it felt like I had to still fight to prove that I, I like suffered from discrimination, you know, something so simple that, that it was like, for someone to assume this identity as if it's like a walk in the park if it's just it's just like benefits or something when it was like I was living in France at that time and I'm just like harassed all the time <laughs> I'm like how dare you so that really sparked I think that really changed yeah the whole direction um of the novel and Real life stuff yeah I think another big thing that's like my experience but also so many of my Asian um friends of all yeah every like just being fetishized in relationships I think especially when we're young and 
think that being desired is just automatically a good thing, right? Like someone likes me, that's great. And they also only like Asian, only other Asian people. Oh, okay. So I think those were, I think the two main things that really came together in dissertation as like the main plot lines. Um, mm. Yes. No, I mean, it is, it is so <laughs> insidious because I also feel like when I was dating men and uh, definitely like thought of, you know, like, oh, like to be desired, like, is there a greater thing to aspire to? And mm -hmm. I was dating this white man in college who like, as a fun fact was like, you know, my last girlfriend was half Asian. And I was like, <laughs> What am I supposed to do with this information, Dave? Um, Dave, fucking Dave. Yeah, Dave, Dave. Um, anyway, to put Dave to the side, um, I mean, I think the rage that, you know, you're talking about, like in the rightful sort of infuriation that you feel in response to these events, like it really propels the novel and mm. it, disorientation is, it's a very plotty novel. Like it's a caper. There are so many reveals that are sort of like, I guess I imagine it as like a long tunnel and it's full of curtains and they're like, ah, here's another curtain. Like, here's another curtain. And I, I loved love it. Like as a reader, I loved being surprised constantly by all of these things that I could never have predicted, but also deeply like made sense. And I was curious if you could just talk a little bit about like what it was like to craft such a mm. plot driven novel with so many reveals that like were so surprising to me. And I'm curious if you were surprised at all like in the writing process or if this was sort of all like a master plan that you you had like the diagram with the red string that you were sort of like <laughs> pointing to yeah like what what did what did the process of writing the plot look like whoa okay this is the first time I've ever been asked this question look at you you already we didn't even like know I didn't even know beforehand and this and I'm just getting asked such a great question about yeah plot like and twists. Okay, so I I love twists. I'm just such a geek for twists. Um, and I'm, I've been trying to wonder, like, why? Like, why do we love a twist, you know, in the reading and, like, viewing experience? Like, what about it is so pleasurable? It's like, I don't know, I guess a lot of times we sort of are trying to be one step ahead, and we're trying to, like, figure out everything and put the puzzle pieces together, right? And then maybe there is something enjoyable about that control being taken away and being like, ooh, it's not as I thought, but you know, you want it to still be logical because like the worst kind of twist is the one that has no inner logic and it's like just sort of thrown at you. Like things should fall into place afterwards, which I hope um, I've, I've done. But yeah, I think putting together, it all, I'm, I would just sit and think for a long time and, and sort of take something in one direction. And then I'd be like, what if, but what if this happened after? And then I'd be like tickled by that, like, oh, that would be fun. And so then I'd maybe write in that direction. And then I'd be like, oh, but what if this happened? I just, I don't know why I have this compulsion. I mean, I, I realized about myself as a writer, I have a lot of anxiety over boring someone. And I think this is like, not even writing a thing. I think it's a me thing. I think it's like a deep seated, like from childhood, like needing to feel like, like I could keep someone's attention almost, I think in a friend group where I would feel othered and I would feel like on the side because you know, surprise, I was often like the only um, Asian person in, in a group. So I think it was maybe an anxiety that stems from that, that I carried into my writing, which was like, God, the, the worst thing I can imagine is boring. This one. <laughs> and so I think that's like, yeah, where maybe my love of twists also come from. And I, 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 yeah, just every time I sort of created, you know, one storyline I would try to challenge myself with like yeah my little mm. what if questions and and bring it deeper and deeper and a lot of times they would sometimes come as surprises like I remember I think the reveal about Azumi's true character I think that came like later and then it was like oh obviously this is where it was all leading towards like she has to be this 
I think it, it happened like that. I can't even remember. Uh, <laughs> but yeah. Yeah, just asking those what ifs. <laughs> I mean, I, I love that. And it's so, it's so interesting to hear you talk about this sort of instinct towards twists as coming from an anxious place because it doesn't, like I did not get any of that as a reader and it really felt like mm. almost like gleeful <laughs> in the number of twists that like you you had in store for us. And it really felt like it came from this like delightfully diabolical place. Um, <laughs> So sometimes we can't do great things with our anxiety. Yes. <laughs> In addition to going to therapy. <laughs> um, something that I, I really wanted to talk to you about in this book. I think one of my favorite themes throughout it was just this friendship between Ingrid Yang and Eunice Kim. Um, and, you know, Ingrid is a Taiwanese American student and Eunice is a Korean American student. And they both have really different experiences and viewpoints of like being Asian and writing about Asian culture, Asian culture, and like dating as Asian women. And these two different experiences sort of like push them together and pull them apart throughout the book. And it was really interesting to sort of read their awakenings, like their racial awakenings alongside each other. And I was curious if you could talk a little bit more about what it was like to sort of write this friendship that felt so real and so complicated, but also like I don't know, it felt to me almost like the heart of the book. Oh, I love that. Yeah. And when that, because like, like you said, there's like these big plotty things and it's one of the things that maybe can be overlooked is their friendship, but I'm so glad to you that it felt central. And I'm, man, I think this shows why failing is, is good and important because <laughs> I wrote three versions and in the first two versions of the novel Eunice did not exist and Ingrid literally didn't have any friends <laughs> it wasn't until like yeah I think around when by the time I finished the second version which was written in the in the first person and that was like a disaster for for different reasons but I was like what she's going through so much alone she's uncovering a lot of big um wild things just on her own and she has no one to really confide in because she becomes so secretive around Stephen Wright and she feels she can't communicate with him anymore and just can't see him the same anymore so I was like why have I decided to make her go through this alone and um in real life we we have friends like even if you just have like not a lot you usually you usually have a a friend <laughs> and so Eunice, yeah, that's how Eunice was born. I was like, in this third version, I'm finally giving her a friend. And I thought it would be fun to give Ingrid a friend in a lot of ways that they don't make sense. Because Ingrid, we could call to start this debate an East Coast Asian, <laughs> where she has like neuroticisms and, and just um, certain hangups around her identity that maybe someone like Eunice, who grew up in uh, the San Gabriel Valley, which is like 90% Asian or even higher. West Coast Asians weigh in in the chat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she, and, and so, and the funny thing is I'm a West Coast Asian, but I have these hangups and, because it's just, the, it's like, depending on where you are in California, some parts of California um, are still like super white, you know? So anywho, but I thought it would be interesting that her friend is someone who always felt comfortable being Asian and never uh, felt left out. So she, so the thing she does that Ingrid sort of politicizes to Eunice has nothing to do with race, like double eyelid surgery or wearing eyelid tape or bleaching her hair blonde. She is just like, what? I look cute. Like I want to look cute. <laughs> like she, and it's, she never wanted to look like white people and and was not surrounded by them growing up um and so in a lot of ways they don't make sense you, you know because of their upbringings of being so different but then I was like but they do make a lot of sense in I think their inherent sort of like squirrely furtive natures <laughs> and also in their um yeah just not really questioning the world around them or like the systems that have built been built around them um, and so they sort of both have to go through that journey together um, and I think yeah something that I wanted to write too was just yeah in Ingrid's anxiety around Asian women 
and uh, having to recognize her, you know, initial hatred of someone like Eunice and then having to question like, where does that come from? Um, yeah, so I wanted to build in those layers, but I'm so glad that people love their friendship so much. Um, some, a reader one time told me like, the thing that I imagine after the novel ends is Eunice and Ingrid create a true crime podcast together. And I was like, you are breaking my heart. This is the best thing I've ever heard. Um, yeah. What are your thoughts on like <laughs> the, different, di the different Asians <laughs> or just like, I don't know, growing up around a lot of Asian verses? Because our, our growing up experiences were pretty different. I remember like you described the people, the popular people at your school were like so different from my popular people at my school, which was the very sort of stereotypical that you would see in like a TV, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, I mean, I would, first off, I would love to see Ingrid and Eunice do the amazing race together. I think they would win. <laughs> um, and totally. so I am a West Coast Asian. I'm from the Bay Area um, and I am half white, half Chinese. And when I grew up, like, I don't think I realized how spoiled I was by the glut of half Asians and Asians just like in my school. And there was like a popular Asian clique and then there was like a popular white clique. And I remember, I mean, I was, I was not in the popular, but I like really aspired to be in the like popular Asian clique. And like, as a child, like all I wanted to be was full Asian because I think I perceived like that would give me access to mm. this, this social group that like was just, I mean, honestly, like they all grew up to be Eunice's, like they are living their best life. They are hot. Like they're proud of themselves. And I, yeah, wish them well and um, envy them, envy them a lot as as a kid. And I mean, I think that's part of what feels so real about all of these, like I don't know, that sort of trifecta of Asian women at the heart of the story of like Vivian Vo and Eunice and Ingrid and you know all these different people who are in different levels of sort of their awareness and like political awakening of like their Asian identity. But I think all envy different things about each other that they're also like not willing to voice but like sort of yeah dictates like why they lie in certain instances in the text and why they sort of move toward this other identity and like sort of try it on to be like could I be this kind of Asian like could I be this kind of Asian <laughs> I really related to it oh yeah yeah hearing your experience was like that was one of I've had a few of these conversations I'm always so curious and I remember that one was one that like I was like I Asian representation, like just sort of how we think about it. Yeah, it's so finite because it was like, I've never seen that, you know? And like, yeah, my community or at least, well, okay, no, I should say this, like a couple of Asian guys I grew up with, like literally obsession, obsession with, as everyone said then, hapas. And now we know that is an appropriated term. And if, you know, one is not Hawaiian, you know, anyways, but I remember like we, I would like people would just write it on like the board. Like I love, Hapa girls or something like you would just come into class and like see it and then I remember like yeah like my guy friends who had this sort of I realize now like unhealthy fixation I think but anyways um because when you fixate on any sort of person it's like this is probably not not healthy but I would feel like oh I'm lacking in some way you know because I I don't have whatever whatever and then it's just like, it's all context, right? Like it was the opposite when you were growing up. That's the really, I would just love to see more of that in the stories about us and the stories we tell, right? And that's why I'm glad like we can talk about this right now because honestly, yeah, we don't see it talked about a lot. And I think to a lot of mainstream media, like it's just confusing if we're not the same. Mm -hmm. and, and it's like, we don't, then we don't make sense to them. And then we're like, oh, we don't know how to like, just like use them as a demographic for like voting or <laughs> so they need us to yeah. just all make sense and but we're all everything every yeah everyone has like a different story but anyway. and that's why we're grateful for disorientation where people make decisions that I find very questionable but also <laughs> are chaotic and fun um <laughs> so to pivot away from uh talking about Asian women I want to ask about a white man <laughs> um ask me thinking about Michael Derrick Hudson, which I remember reading about in college and 
yeah, being so angry and so shocked. Um, I was thinking a lot about sort of the way that you depicted art in this book. Like, I think it's hard to write about a work of art that, you know, like, like, you know, like to include like a, a description of a painting or a poem that is like supposed to be really good. Like, I think it's just hard to sort of do that sort of like Mary, Maritroshka doll of like, here's an art within an art. Um, but the poems of Xiao and Chao in this book, um, you know, a famous Chinese poet who uh, is not all that he seems. Um, I was really interested in sort of how you created them in this book. Like they're supposed to have this glaze of like mastery and awe, but you know, as, in as Ingrid describes them, they're kind of just like when a, when a red lacquered box appears in the poem, it's simply that, like that's all it is. Mm -hmm. um, and some of the examples of poems that are not actually included in the text of disorientation, but alluded to like playground porridge <laughs> about the poet's uh, shame of being teased about his thousand year old egg porridge at school. <laughs> like they're almost like mockeries. And I was curious if you could talk a little bit about how you sort of created the canon of Xiao and Chao in this book and what it was like to like embody the identity of this poet as you actually wrote poems from his perspective. <laughs> oh my god this is a, another amazing fun question I have literally never been asked before. Um, okay so if anyone, if anyone is is like afraid of spoilers, I'm just gonna have to put it. I'm just, I just right now putting it out there. Um, I will mention this so in the next five minutes. You can go on mute, and then it'll be fine. Um, okay. So I had to ask myself if a white man was trying to embody a Chinese American identity, like how far could he reach like it would it would all be surface I think it I was like his grasp of what would constitute a passing Chinese American identity would be just it would be very exotifying so like I think most of Xiao and Xiao's poems I think there's like I gave some example what where are the titles like kumquats on an autumn day <laughs> like the I Ching sonnets uh, lions guarding a gate I'm just like this is a guy who just like went to a Chinese restaurant and was like, hmm. What, What's on the walls? What, right, right. What can, what can I steal that's like, ha, huh, so, so Asian, so in inherently Asian. I just, or he goes to like a pier one imports and is like, ha, huh, in this, in the Asia section, what, what, you know, stands up. So I think it's definitely me poking fun at, I think like digestible East Asian or, you know, Chinese culture because he like the point is he becomes the most fa famous Chinese American poet not because he's the best but because what becomes canon it's what the white institutions around you know writers and poets like so like universities and um publishing imprints like it's what they find accessible digestible um inoffensive very important <laughs> because and it's because he plays to this orientalist fantasy that the west has literally invented um that he succeeds and he's literally giving people what they want i think a lot of our identity around being asian i'm curious to hear how you feel about this too i feel like sometimes it, it seems like we always have to work to sort of unstitch what was sort of shoved down our throats by literally like it's like a white writer made it up and then it just got turned into like oh this is something Asian and Asian American and then we sort of parrot it and what is actually like from us and from the culture and I think it just speaks to like being Asian American means growing up in a country where we were just told what we were for so long and we had it took us so long to be able to say anything ourselves and then when we would say things ourselves like I think a lot of comedians who started out they really use stereotypical jokes that like we didn't invent but they were invented to minimize us and to humanize us they like use those to get famous and and it's like did they even know what they were doing or they just truly like have absorbed what is it? I think that's what's so 
yeah, it can be really heartbreaking um, is wondering like where, where does this propaganda, like invented propaganda end and where does it like be begin? Um, and then, yeah, so that's why his poems are just sort of like supposed to be very surface and uh, as if, yeah, you're looking at like a pure one imports <laughs> or a Chinese restaurant. Um, but tell me your thoughts. What do you think about my theory about <laughs> like Asian American identity? I don't know, just that how much of it is invented versus how much of it is is ours. Yeah, I mean, I think like, I guess it feel, I, I had a complicated relationship growing up with like certain things that, I don't know, like, I guess like white people or like would associate with like Asian culture that like felt very important and like true to me. And like, I have like a real relationship with, but then like to be associated with that or like reduced to like that, like also made me frustrated. It's like, yeah, like soup dumplings are so important to me or yeah, like, I don't know, like Jade is really important to me, but like, I, I don't know, like, I don't want to talk to you about that. Like that's for me <laughs> and not for you. Right, right, right. Yeah. And it's funny how you describe like, yeah, the poems really do feel like, you know, this guy like went through like an exhibition at the Met or something and was like, all right, like uh, I got, I got this quail, like I got this loquat, like I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna turn out a poem. Um, and okay, what's funny I, I, though I, is, pe oh, oh, well, just a quick, a lot of people mm -hmm. think I'm making fun of, I'm referencing, I'm like covertly shading, subtweeting a real like Asian poet, like an Asian American poet. And I'm like, I swear I'm not, but I'm, it is interesting that discourse that people are like, ooh, what, what sellout are you talking about? I'm like, uh, <laughs> that says, that says something about yeah. you. I don't know. But yeah, you, you, you clearly hit a nerve um, in this book. And I, I also wanted, sorry, I have like so many questions to ask. And I realized that we are approaching the time for audience questions. So if you have a question for Elaine, pop it in the chat. Um, but going back to Ingrid, I found her to be such a relatable protagonist as she sort of spirals um, in her quest to finish her dissertation and sort of resorts to like a lot of perhaps unhealthy coping mechanisms, like popping a lot of antacids, which I didn't even know that like antacids could be something that you like take too many of, but like I believe it and now I'm like monitoring my own intake of antacids. But I was curious, like writing a book is so hard, <laughs> it sucks and it's like a journey full of challenges. And I was curious, like, as you were writing Disorientation in its many drafts, like, what were your coping mechanisms to get you through the book process? Oh, God, such a great question. I mean, I think coming from academia, so I had, like, done, well, I feel like my sort of academic career started in, like, my, my senior year of college, because I did um, an honors thesis for, why did I do this to myself? And I was just, like, my senior year kind of sucked because I was just in the library all the time and I was torturing myself because I wanted to write on Derrida. I was so lame. Everyone please judge me that I was that person in high, in college being like, I'm reading Derrida and I get it. No, I don't. No one gets it. Um, and I, I then at that point, like writing was felt torturous and reading Derrida and then having to pretend I understand him was torturous. And then when I went into, I did um, one year of a master's and then two and a half years of a PhD. And again, just reading like a ton of texts and academic texts are so funny because an academic text is judged on how um, unclear it is and how confusing it is, how opaque it is. The more accessible and clear an academic text is, the more it's seen as like subpar. <laughs> but I don't know. I think it's just, it's just speaking to like why academia really needs a big overhaul because if something is not accessible and clear, it's, it's, it's literally the definition of elitism. Um, and I don't know, but it's still, it's still going on today. So, <laughs> I was torturing myself reading these academic texts and then having to try to mirror that language in my own dissertation. And there was there was no joy from it. Like it was always grueling, it was always work, um, obviously, but just, I associate it with pain, okay. 
<laughs> so then when I gleefully quit my PhD, which everyone, I, I support you, if you have these feelings, give in to them, just quit. <laughs> and, um, what, and then started writing fiction again. I was like, oh my God. It was like it was like if I'd been raised on a diet of I don't know like breadcrumbs and I suddenly was at like a buffet you know it was like writing is fun and joyful and I don't have to read Derrida I don't have to like cite all these texts it's like you know it was it felt like a playground to me and I think that was why even though writing is is always hard in a lot of ways because at that point I hadn't written fiction in so long. Um, and also when you're writing a, a, your first book, like you just truly never know if anyone will read it. So I think the first drafts were always fun in this way of just like, I'm making myself laugh. I'm shitting on white men. I'm <laughs> doing all the things I wish I could do. And so uh, I, I think I, I got to try to make the process um, enjoyable for myself. And then of course, when the draft would end and then I had to revise, it was like, ah, pain. And then realizing like this draft didn't work. I have to start over again from scratch pain. So, so there was, would be pain, but I think the joy that I built in for myself was, well, okay. I would say I had built up a tolerance to it because of the PhD. So when people were like, mm. oh, how did you kind of write like a lot of these, like like sort of large drafts and then you know and like three of them I'm like I think the PhD trained me to suffer through it <laughs> which speaks to like why academia also needs a rehaul like we should not be like suffering and 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 sort of straining yourself mentally um but I think it it was like a weird training process for writing um and then yeah I would I mean, I think like a lot of writers, I would, do, I would do little things like, okay, if I write a lot the next day, the next day, ah, write a lot one day, the next day, I will do nothing but binge watch Netflix. Or, you know, I would get like a special treat for myself. Um, really into treating yourself as a, because it is, it, it is, you know, you want to celebrate every little thing, like new paragraph, treat, end of chapter, like double treat and just constantly find a way to treat yourself. What, what are you, some of your treats? If you no, would... I love that. I mean, I'm a very treat driven person, but I, I definitely, that totally makes sense that like being in academia, like working on uh, academic writing, not to bring back this hell exhibit, which is really fun and everyone should go who's in New York, but like we learned that there are different layers, levels to hell and like certain people can go to certain levels and it feels like you peaked <laughs> into the seventh level of hell which was academia. And then you were like, I won't go back. And like, even if you're in the fourth level of hell, which is like editing a monster draft or like scrapping the monster yes. draft, you're like, I'm in the fourth level of hell. Like I have seen, I have seen the seventh, oh. like I shan't be going back there. That, that is a perfect metaphor. I will now be stealing that a hundred percent. Right. Maybe like, yeah, if writers are like, I hate writing fiction or whatever. I'm like, just do a PhD for a couple of years. All right. This will seem like a walk in the <laughs> PhD as boot camp. Yeah. Um, I think I probably have like time for just one more question before we turn to the audience questions. But I just wanted to ask because like, I, I just am obsessed with this cover. Like it is incredible. It is so catchy. Can a cover be catchy? It's like, gorgeous it's stunning and it also is a testament to what I am so proud of you for doing throughout this book process which is like sticking to what you know is good and what you know is beautiful and like advocating for yourself and your vision mm -hmm. so I wanted to ask if you could talk a little bit about the collaboration behind this cover and how it came to be oh thank you as um everyone right now please google uh Aaliyah hold on let me put Aaliyah. Um, and, and on TikTok, I think it's Slime Town USA. Slime Town USA. <laughs> yes, the best, the best name ever. Okay, so <laughs> Aaliyah is a, an incredible artist. Um, she builds tiny dioramas. Oh, and I should mention she works a lot um, with Sam Copeland, and they build their sets together. Um, and yeah, she makes she makes snail art. So she puts her pet snails in these wonderfully 
they're always her worlds are always kind of skewed you know it's always like it's like if it's like a supermarket it's like a little weird of a supermarket if it, you know and um I thought the I wanted the vibe of disorientation to be that right and I wanted a cover that could reflect that the world is skewed um and when I was, I, I love Atlanta so much, I think for that reason. And I read like that Donald Glover was inspired by Afro surrealism. And then when I finally read that like famous uh, manifesto from I think like SF Chronicle or something, if people um, wanna look it up, it's described as just an inherent absurdity in the world um, that like the inherent absurdity, absurdity of believing we live in a post-racial world there's nothing more absurd than that and I think I wanted to just capture a sense of unease and uh Aaliyah's work does that so amazingly and so even though she had never <laughs> designed a book cover before I just I just knew she could and I and it was a fight and I did have to yeah like it, this this was not mm, you know, uh, <laughs> I'm just saying how to The cover process can be difficult. Like there's just like a lot of decisions that go into it, a lot of different parties weighing in. I also had, yeah, like a long cover process. Yeah, um, yeah. And so, but somehow I just was like, I think if anyone can capture it, it's her. And so when we work together, first of all, she's an incredible human, um, so kind and and humble and, you know, she's, wildly talented and then like so down to earth but we sort of talked about key scenes in the in the novel and and which ones would be the most compelling oh I've never talked about this I could tell you some of the like the other top ones was the one the the famous vanity mirror scene where you know John Smith is like sitting at the vanity table so we had like an idea around that mm -hmm. There was one, this, and this was a cover option that was really, I think would have made a really cool cover too, was it's the archive where you see Xiao and Chow's like, you know, big oil painting portrait and there's just green slime like coming out of the archive and over the painting and because she does great slime work. <laughs> Everyone check out the slime work. Um, so yeah, she was just so collaborative and open and every time I praise her, she's always like, we did it together. And I'm like, you're the genius. <laughs> Anyways, all we do is just love on each other. But to everyone who doesn't know, she built everything from hand. There's no Photoshop. I think there was Photoshop and just like lightly finishing, you know, like the lights or the lighting and, and stuff like that. But those objects are held by tiny wires. So if you show the the diorama from a different angle you literally see these tiny white wires holding up everything yes yeah so i literally i try to tell as many people as i can because because i realized last year people would just be like the photoshop on this is is amazing and i was like photoshop <laughs> I, have to, yeah, I have to clear up this mistake right away there was no photoshop and this is just in very talented hard work with you know, like hands you know like a real um yeah so that that's that's the story and I'm so glad I can yeah shout out Aaliyah and everyone everyone follow her work that's amazing I will be thinking about this alternate slime slime cover in my dreams um <laughs> but I do want to make sure we have uh I want to pivot to audience questions and um I think the first one that we got um, from Kim, can you please talk about the creation of Vivian Vo and some of her flaws or shortcomings? I love this question. Um, I love Vivian so much. And I think in first drafts, a couple beta readers were like, do we like Vivian? And I was like, yes, we love Vivian. Vivian is just so overworked. And I think um, I've talked about this a little bit before, but um, like in other bit, I did have anxiety creating a pretty main character who was Southeast Asian because um, I, I was like, you know, am I equipped to write about that? But I knew that 
sort of within Barnes University, if there was one person who could call out like structural institutional justice, what was was not going to be an East Asian person. I was just like, especially, I don't know, as I think, you know, the novel set in 2016. And I was looking, like really looking at what was around me. And I would, when I would be in these spaces where people were like, calling out East Asian privilege, or just how we've really have been soldiers for white supremacy in a lot of ways, it, they would be South Asian or Southeast Asian activists. And then like, I felt like the East Asian, we'd have to like catch up <laughs> a little bit. You know? And so I was like, I also think I'm writing, I was trying to reflect like the community around me. So I was like, that's why I'm making her a Viet. And um, I think I put a lot of uh, sort of a part of my life into Vivian in the period where I was having, you know, when I was getting into organizing and activism in um, Paris in 2014, I just felt so clueless and like angry at myself that I was clueless. Like, why was I so late? Why did I have so much to catch up on? And then I think insecurity around being late and not having read like all these unnecessary texts that a lot of like hardcore activists have known I was like you sort of overcompensate so I think I like I discovered you know once I started kind of unpacking and doing like I very quickly jumped to being like I need to overcompensate by like scolding other East Asians <laughs> So then I definitely found myself just being in some Facebook groups like circa, I don't know, like, yeah, 2060, it just being like, you need to unpack. I'm just like, I think I'm being really like, it can be in a way. I, yeah. Anyways, this is why I think I can sort of poke fun at the times where Vivian can is doing a lot because I was doing a lot. And I think I had burnout from activism in a way that I think Vivian has burnout. Um, and, th and then once you begin to position yourself as an activist who's like speaking out, you, your entire identity feels like it's writing on that. So you feel, you feel like, I remember like if a single police shooting happened and I didn't immediately like speak up against it and like go outside and but, you know, that everyone would be like, oh, Elaine doesn't care anymore, or she's a friend. And, and so I wanted, yeah, I think I was trying to capture that with Vivian's characters, that anxiety. Um, and how a lot of the activists, I think, that we saw in 2014, 2016, all the sort of waves, you don't, we don't necessarily see them again, because burnout's very real, and, and they're not given the often emotional, like, resources to, to keep going, and you just feel you, you, yeah, you can just feel down and like nothing's ever going to change. So why am I doing this? It's, it's real. I feel like, yeah, we don't always talk about that side of what sort of happens after the protest and after the organizing ends. And it's like, is anyone caring? Does anyone talk about it anymore? Yeah, no, I, I, love, I love that <laughs> answer. Um, we have two questions from Georgia Way. I'll just ask them both. And maybe if you want to answer just one or both like quickly. Um, how did you decide the right age for your protagonist? Did that feel like a general time that you've witnessed Asian women have this kind of racial awakening? Um, and the other question is, would love to hear some of your favorite Asian friendships in literature. Ooh, um, yeah, those at a timeline. So Ingrid is 29 and she turns 30 in the novel. And so she's, and it takes place in 2016. So she was born in, hold on, who's really good at math? Uh, 2016 minus, okay, yeah, 1987. She was born around 1987. So that to me felt accurate for, like, I think if she was younger, it would be like, why isn't she more caught up? Like, it, like she had to be roughly around, that age um because that would also felt true to me like what I was seeing around me was uh that generation yeah just sort of like a, a complacency right she Ingrid is not she's not like evil she's not a, a republican she identifies as a democrat and a liberal and everything but she she's been complacent and she, and she's been complicit because she was complacent. And I think I just saw a lot of that. And um, 
the younger generation I felt was much more open to questioning and had grown up also without some of the that baggage we've talked about right so when you don't have you haven't been maybe indoctrinated the same way of course you can question the system because you're more outside of it and you you don't seek its approval whereas Ingrid grew up in the context where she absolutely is seeking that approval and is afraid to you know break out of it um so so that was that like sort of pragmatic side um yeah, and do I think a lot of people have that coming of age? I think I think it can happen at I guess it can happen at any age. I think it's just our experiences, yeah, within the Asian American um, community is so vast. Really depend like it can depend on your parents. Um, if you're adopted, like your adoptive parents, sort of politics, um, where in the world you're from, or just like where the friends around you. So I think that sort of social political awakening truly can be at any any age. Um, and I think what sort of is amazing is like seeing first gen immigrants, like my parents' age, like having that, you know, they can be in their like 60s and it's like, yeah, it can still happen. Um, yes, and then favorite Asian um, friendships, I mean, does one between sisters count? I think so. Yeah. I feel like, uh, have people read Revenge of the Half, um, Revenge of the Mooncake Vixen by Marilyn Chin? I'll put that. I think this, the, the sort of friendship between these two sisters is so raw and honest, but also just wacky and, and fun and they're, very open I think with their like flaws with each other and um I don't know that's the one that jumped into my head and always love to shout out Marilyn Chin like OG so check that out <laughs> I love that um Ming Lung wants to know what are you working on next um there's a short story question yeah where are you really from that I really am supposed to be revising <laughs> and working on adapting disorientation into a novel. Hopefully, you know, it's it's in the into process. Into a movie? Oh, sorry, into a movie. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I guess. Amazing. Um, I guess this kind of leads into another question from Jay Park. How have you found the experience of adapting the novel for film? How do you manage writing across various mediums and maybe carrying multiple projects that jump between different mediums? it's so fun I'm like I've become a real geek for screenwriting I I think it's a very difficult craft and I I am humbled by how difficult it is and I think yeah there can be an assumption that it's it's easy I think it's when you have a set of constraints it's very hard and it's not the finished product the way like fiction it's very intuitive because you you can read it and it's like that's a finished product <laughs> um so i've it's been really fun to challenge myself with pushing the story in a different direction so with the film we're making it darker creepier more psychological um and i i love asking yeah like what can i do with this new medium that i couldn't do in the book and thinking of the ways we can make it more cinematic and then teaching myself really to write visually. Um, and and you, you sort of have to like become a camera. I realize like screenwriting is you become just like a camera or like an eyeball. <laughs> and um, juggling different product projects, I think I think I recommend this for just all writers. I think anytime you're away from run project, you'll be inspired by something else and return to it having like, I don't know, fresh eyes. So I think whenever we're working on multiple things, it's, they still all inform each other, you know, and um, giving yourself that break can really help you, I think, stay excited about that one. And so, you know, when you just work on one thing over and over, which is what I was kind of doing with the novel, it can be like, yeah, a lot. So I have found juggling them, um, great and and it really helps break up um writing and just being creative in a way that I think is more like manageable in these bite-sized mm. chunks 
Um, I think we maybe have time for one more question, but before I ask that audience question, I just wanted to alert everyone to the fact that we are wearing the same <sighs> shirt. I don't know if anyone have recognizes. Alien. Who, who knows? Put in the chat. Yeah, sound out in the know. comments if oh, you recognize. Girls. <laughs> Lane Kim, look at her. One of the first, and me and, me and Sabrina have talked a lot about how Lane's storyline ends, like, just, like, really did her wrong but but she was in a badass band and and like so so cool to see like in the 90s yeah an Asian um an Asian girl just like rocking out in a band an icon in a trailblazer um, <laughs> but we do have oh I just wanted to ask this quickly because I think it can be answered quickly but we have a question from Ingrid Wren um, hi, Ale hi, Elaine. My name is Ingrid and I'm East Asian. The representation of this character, Ingrid Yang, simply existing is astounding and wonderful to me. And I'm super curious, how and why did you decide on this name Ingrid, which has very white and Scandinavian roots slash vibes? Ooh, yes. There was an early, the first version. Okay, so I remember when I was going through just, I made a list of names and for some reason, I was really drawn to I names. I can't remember why. This, this was like really early on before I even pivoted to like the Michael Derrick Hudson storyline, um, where I remember like Iris was a close like second. And I, I can't remember why. But then when I finally settled on Ingrid, um, I remember a very early version has it that her dad named her that because he loved Ingrid Bergman. Mm. and then I and then I took it out like it never appears again but it's funny how a lot of writing that the drafts that you throw away they sort of you need to write them just so you know things and then you don't necessarily put them you know on uh, leave them in the page but I think it was interesting to me that like sometimes an immigrant like like parent like her like her dad fixated on on someone that he thought like represented something I don't know that she's not even American you know <laughs> I don't know represented mm. something like glamorous or um and and the fact that then he would sort of impart it to his daughter who doesn't Ingrid wow. you're killing wow. me you're killing me this is so wild and I also I realize that we're kind of over time yes, so I just time. wanted to say Thank you so much, Elaine, for your generosity and wisdom. Thank you for this incredible book and its long afterlife. It was a real honor to do this. And thank you, AAWW and T, for hosting. Thank you to the interpreters and I'll pass it off. Oh my God. Thank you, Sabrina. This was so amazing just getting to hang with you. And it felt just like being in, you know, on your couch chatting and um yes want to echo thank you to everyone who came made time in your day to hang out and um t a w w the uh interpreters you, you guys are all amazing i just also yeah i think everyone being here i've just been so astounded by like so many people's support but i think the support of the asian american community and something like a w i feel like i've have i been inducted into the family because i'm like i wasn't a fellow i was i did have a flash fiction piece in the march so i'm like i'm part of the family <laughs> anyways but i just want to say the support has meant so much to me love you guys <laughs> thank you both so much i do want to say once you're in you you are you are the family you are part of the family so i tell everyone that <laughs> which is a lot of people because I've been here for six and a half years. So we have a big family. Um, thank you all so much for being here. Thank you, Elaine, for your beautiful work and for sharing your space with the sharing space with us this evening, you and Sabrina as well. Thank you, Sabrina, for moderating such a special conversation. Thank you to Jenna and Ezekiel from Pro Bono ASL for providing ASL interpretation this evening. And I am actually all the whole event. I was like, are they wearing Hep Alien tissue? <laughs> you recognize Hep Alien? I was just like, I didn't <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure it says that elderly alien. <laughs> so thank you for sharing that with us. <laughs> um, we coordinated. We did. <laughs> thank you. Um, so special. Finally, thank you to our audience. Thank you for spending your Tuesday evening with us. And we will see you soon. Thank you, everyone.
拜。